In an article charmingly entitled, Oh No, I've Become a Trad, Neil Addison tells readers of Mass of Ages, the, mass of, uh, the magazine of the Latin Mass Society of England and Wales, about his and his wife's unexpected return after a period of over four decades to the Mass of their childhood. He writes of his first re-encounter with a high Mass. Quote, it would be wonderful but inaccurate to say that attending that Mass was a road to Damascus. Wow, this is what I've been looking for moment. But the reality was that we simply decided it was sort of nice and we could maybe go back occasionally just to see how this experiment was working. What we hadn't banked on was that the Latin Mass is subtly seductive. You think a little won't affect you and suddenly you're going regularly. In many respects, the Latin Mass is easier than the English Mass, where I can sometimes feel I am being lectured at the entire time. With the traditional Mass, I simply have the chance to be present at a sacred event and time to pray." Unquote. I'm sure many here can relate to what Mr. Addison is talking about. There are two things that leap out to me in his testimony. First, he calls the Latin Mass subtly seductive. He's right, but why is he right? What is it about the old liturgy that works in a subtle way to draw us into the act of worship? Second, he talks about the paradox of the old liturgy being somehow easier than the new one, in spite of the fact that the whole Catholic world was turned upside down in the 1960s in order to make the Mass more accessible, as the experts said. But accessibility turned into vernacular verbosity, and that causes a lot of people to be bored and to forget about God, about prayer to God about being with God. There are many reasons the Latin Mass is effective at what it does, effective in communicating what can never be fully put into human words. When I say communicate, I mean it in the old-fashioned sense, entering into communion with, as when we talk of Catholics communicating at Mass, meaning receiving the Lord. For this is the crucial thing, not hearing talk about God, but meeting God, seeing Him, tasting Him, this evening, I will explore one of the more important aspects of the traditional Latin Mass, the dominance and power of nonverbal language. I think it's fair to say that the Latin Mass, whether we're speaking of a low Mass, a high Mass, a solemn high Mass, or a pontifical Mass, is characterized by a sacred atmosphere, a prayer-saturated environment that helps us to quiet down and connect with God. What is it that creates this atmosphere? Imagine a person with no knowledge of the Catholic faith, or perhaps even of Christianity, deciding out of curiosity to step from a bright sunlit street into a church or chapel. As his eyes adjust, he sees a number of faithful dotted here and there in the pews, kneeling and looking ahead. At the far end of the church, in a more open area with more decoration than the rest of the church, he sees a group of men dressed in strange and elaborate garb, clustered around a large marble object with candles across it. They are all facing the same direction as the faithful. They are intensely focused on what they are doing. Their bodies block our view of their work, but they look as if they're huddling around a victim to kill it. It is clear at any rate that their attention is not focused on the people. Our observer feels that something very solemn and serious is happening and that everyone in the building is, in their different ways, utterly united in this action, whatever it may be. If, in addition, he hears chant or polyphony and smells incense and feels the hard wood against his legs worn smooth by so many worshipers, four of his senses will be like the four evangelists, proclaiming a presence to him, even if he is not yet able to call it by name. Our hypothetical visitor has already received his first and most important lesson in the Christian religion, that something above and beyond man is the center of attention the goal of our strivings, the purpose of our lives. We have here a foundational experience of man turning himself towards the source of his being and destiny. As the old prayer says, I acknowledge thee to be my creator and sovereign Lord. Nothing, no amount of catechesis or homiletics or pastoral programs can ever substitute for this experience. Without this immediate and wordless awareness of God as the fearful and fascinating mystery, for whose sake we stop paying attention for a moment to each other and to this world and stumble up to the edge of his domain so that his, his presence may infiltrate and permeate 
our domain. Without this, I say, there is no religion at all, no worship, no liturgy. So, of course, what I was describing there was Christians worshiping ad orientem, right? Everyone facing eastwards. Christians worshiped this way for centuries before anyone thought to give an explanation in writing of why they do so. Worship ad orientem is not a doctrine, though it has doctrinal foundations and implications. It is not a statement or assertion or text that we can analyze. It is a bodily posture, an action we perform, an attitude we take with our being. It is, in that sense, pre-doctrinal, pre-verbal, pre-conceptual. And that is part of the reason why it is so fundamental. The first things human beings take in after birth and during infancy are not subject predicate statements, but simple, sensible images. Language and thought grow in us slowly, but the face of our mother leaning over us in love is there from the start, immediate, palpable, dominating, and determinative. The fundamental symbols of the liturgy are like this. They train us before we know we are being shaped by them. They determine our thoughts before we think them. They impress the truth on our eyes, ears, and noses, on our hands and knees. The gestures, postures, and objects of Christian worship are, for this reason, no less important than the texts of the liturgy. The practice of offering the Mass eastwards teaches us wordlessly that worship is about God, not about us. Or rather, it is about us only insofar as we are from God, in God, and for God. Hence, even though, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the liturgy is for our needs, since God, who is infinitely good, stands to gain nothing from our actions, it is still done for the love and praise and thanking of God, who is the source and fulfillment of our needs. Our need, in short, is for God, and our deepest need is to go beyond ourselves into Him. The purpose of worship is to take us out of ourselves and establish us in God. This objective orientation, we, we can't avoid the East even in the way we speak, orientation, right, turning to the East, should be visible, evident to the senses, easily grasped by the mind, and easily translated into the movement of the will that we call love. In connection with this visual orientation is the sonic orientation produced by three elements working together, silence, sacred music, and the Latin language. Silence is a theme on which there is so much to be said, paradoxically, that we could never come to the end of it. It is important to recognize a few things about liturgical silence. First, it did not arise historically because people said, we want to have long stretches of silence when no one is doing anything. Sitting around in a group and doing nothing has never been a part of Christian worship. That's more like transcendental meditation or yoga. In reality, silences arose in the liturgy because ministers were busy doing something, either without words or whispering their accompanying prayers, and the result to the people was a gap in sound, as far as the other participants were concerned, especially in a larger church where people might be located very far from the sanctuary. In other words, the silences of traditional Western liturgical rites are byproducts, you might say, of the hierarchical and theocentric nature of the action. Everything is in some sense directed to God, otherwise it would not be liturgy, and not everything is for our eyes and our ears. The Roman canon is the greatest example of this phenomenon. The canon was originally said aloud. In fact, the Emperor Justinian, a busybody like most of the Byzantine emperors, tried to enforce its audible recitation by law. But already in ancient times, it was said with a low voice and eventually came to be said silently. At the most solemn moment of the liturgy, when the words of the priest bring the sacrifice of Christ into our midst, or rather bring us to the glorified Christ reigning in heaven, it seemed highly fitting that the priest should whisper it rather than recite it or sing it aloud. I am reminded of the words of Cardinal Robert Seurat. Before God's majesty, we lose our words. Who would dare to speak up before the Almighty? To refuse this silence filled with confident awe and adoration is to refuse God the freedom to capture us by his love and his presence. In like manner, Joseph Ratzinger said, 
we respond by singing and praying to the God who addresses us, but the greater mystery surpassing all words summons us to silence. There is a psychological paradox at work here. That which is silent is in fact louder to the ear of the heart than that which falls upon the eardrum. In the same way that we tend to notice when something is missing from a certain spot, rather than when things are present where they usually are. To put it as simply as possible, when everything is visible, nothing is seen. When everything is audible, nothing is heard. The coming to be of the silent word is accentuated by the going away of organized sound. The real presence is accentuated by the real absence. Silence is the golden setting for the jewel of mystery. At least in the Western tradition, as it has developed over the past 2,000 years, lack of silence indicates lack of mystery. The liturgy is inherently musical as well. We sometimes forget this due to the popularity of the low mass, which began as a private devotion for monastic priests and for the fulfillment of mass intentions for the living and the dead, and has eventually spread to parishes because of its convenience for work days and for Sundays with multiple masses to accommodate overflow crowds. But the church's liturgical rites, above all the mass and the divine office, originated in singing and for their full expression and impressiveness are meant to be sung. The Mass did not start as a bunch of spoken prayers with music being added on later as an ornament. No, the two modalities of liturgy were singing and silence. Contrary to what people might think, in history it was the pontifical Mass that came first, that is the Bishop's Mass, followed by its simplification, the Solemn Mass, then the simplified version of that, the Missa Cantata, or High Mass, and finally the simplified version of that, the Low Mass. So that's the sequence in which it happened historically. Singing is a heightened form of expression, conveying dignity, seriousness, joy, exultation, and carrying with it a peculiar emotional effect that goes beyond the semantic content of the words. In a uniquely powerful way, Gregorian chant, the music native to the Roman rite, is words with wings, born of a deep savoring of the word of God in harmony with divine beauty and capable of lifting the mind and heart to the threshold of eternity. With its unsurpassed variety of modal melodies and its unmetered free rhythm, this chant, instantly recognizable as sacred music, poignantly signals that we are in the presence of God and are there to offer him the incense of our lips and hearts. There is no other type of music that even comes close to Gregorian chant for the otherworldliness that the Mass demands. Let me put it this way. Chant is not entertainment music, or fill-in-the-gaps background music, or keeping people busy music. It is ritual music. That is, it embodies and actualizes and carries forward an act of worship, and therefore counts as itself a sacrificial offering, blessed by him and bestowing blessings on those who fall into its waves. This is why St. Thomas can say that even if people don't know the meaning of every word that is being chanted, as long as they know it is sung for God's glory, that is enough to arouse their devotion. After singing and listening to chant for many years, I find melodies and words coming back to me at odd hours of the day and night, reminding me of God and of my heavenly fatherland. This music puts down deep roots in the soul. When we hear it start up in church, the very sound of it calls us to prayerful attention. In that way, I would argue that Gregorian chant is a fine example of non-verbal language, since there is so much more going on with it than mere words. It obviously has words, but it has more than words. Ritual silence partners with ritual music to form a supernatural wildlife refuge for Christians endangered by the pollution of noise, chatter, ugliness, and disordered passions. It might seem odd to bring up Latin in a talk that's supposed to be about nonverbal language, but the reality is that a language is much more than a collection of exchangeable tokens for the immediate transferal of information. In his masterful book on the traditional Latin mass, Michael Fiedrowitz writes, and no one has ever said it better, if sacred languages existed in numerous cultures in almost all epochs of history and still continue to exist, this fact is an expression of a fundamental human need. In the background stands a particular religious experience that shapes and changes speech and language. 
It is the experience of something supernatural, divine, transcendent, and wholly other, to which man seeks to respond by using a language that differentiates itself from the form of everyday speech. Herein lies the origin of so-called hieratic or priestly languages. Far from creating a language barrier, the sacred language calls to mind that religion has something else to say to man than the everyday. The sacred language prevents man from dragging the divine down to his own level and instead lifts man up to the divine, which it does not, however, reveal and expose completely to the human understanding, but instead indicates as a mystery. Here the church also proves to possess a thorough understanding of human nature, as in this way she helps her faithful to detach themselves from their everyday language, where each word recalls profane realities, and to feel even sensibly the holy other sought by all piety. The sacred language spreads a delicate veil over the truths of the faith, which protects the holy mystery and eludes hasty comprehensibility. That's, that's Fiedrowitz. Dr. Joseph Shaw offers further insights. Neither the inaudibility nor the use of Latin in practice creates a barrier of understanding between the worshiper and the liturgy, since members of the congregation can consult a hand missile, a printout, or a smartphone to see exactly what is being said, if they wish, translated into a wide variety of languages. But Latin, on the other hand, does mark off the liturgy as something special and distinct from ordinary life. When we enter into the Latin zone, so to speak, we are entering into a spiritual space. In this way, Latin powerfully reinforces the atmosphere created by the architecture and fittings of a church building, the special vestments worn by the clergy, the distinct type of music appropriate to the mass, and so on. The Latin of the mass was never in truth the language of the street or of the public speaker. Not only is it often flowery and poetic, but it is strongly marked by the influence of Greek and Hebrew and makes extensive use of repetition and deliberate archaicism. It was it, the Latin of the liturgy, was always intended to be what it is, a distinct, holy language to be used only in the liturgy. One does not have to understand the Latin text word for word as it is spoken to perceive and be moved by the solemn character with which it clothes the liturgy. The meaning of the text can be immediately available to the, to the worshiper in printed form, but the impression made by the form of the text, the fact that it is proclaimed in an ancient sacred language of unique grandeur and gravity, is also of considerable value. That's Joseph Shaw. One of the lessons we can take away from Fiedrowitz and Shaw is that language is never merely language. Its cultural history, the traits and associations of classic works composed in it, the very sound of it falling on the ear, all of this is borne along with the language and often delivers as much impact as, or even a greater impact than, its conceptual freight. I know that for me personally, the moment I hear in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti, amen, intro ibo ad altari dei, I am immediately placed in a different zone. The door to the world is shut. My mind is fixed on the altar. Divine worship has begun. This is the aspect that I'm calling the nonverbal aspect of Latin. It's just, it's just to say it, it's character as a special language and a special sound. In the past 60 years, far too much emphasis has been placed on the vernacular spoken by a particular group of people as if it is somehow the magic key to participation. But it's anything but that. For one thing, a vernacular language immediately excludes everyone who does not speak it. And that includes the less educated who speak a lower register of it, as well as that forgotten group whose education equips them to grasp higher registers as more appropriate in worship, who will be continually vexed by flat, dull, gray modern translations. What the reformers seem to have forgotten is that there is a universal non-verbal vernacular accessible to all mankind, the language of symbols. Be they colors, actions, or other religious signs, this vocabulary has an immediate, although at times perplexing, effect on the consciousness. It shows us reverence without talking about it. It shows us mourning or rejoicing without spelling it out in trite or laborious words. Example, a black chasuble, unbleached candles, a catafalque, and the repeated refrain, requiem eternam, instantly tell us more about the meaning of a liturgy for the dead than a hundred books written on the subject. 
So this brings me to my next major point, symbolism. I'll enter into this topic by making a general point. Nothing in the liturgy is ever merely practical or utilitarian. Everything is symbolic. If clergy process to the altar solemnly or casually, it's not as if the solemn entrance is symbolic, but the casual one isn't. Both of them are, but they signify different and contrary truths. If the clergy wear an elaborate vestment or a plain polyester drape, each is symbolic. If they speak in an ancient hieratic tongue or a modern vernacular, that's symbolic too. And likewise, if one speaks in a natural voice and the other uses a microphone. If they, faced, if they face eastwards with the people or faced westwards over against the people, both are symbolic. If we are singing medieval plain chant or a folksy refrain from the 1970s, that is unquestionably symbolic. As rational animals, which also means social and liturgical animals, human beings are not just wielders of tools, they are weavers of symbols. What we do, what we do, and how we do it carries significance. It cannot be otherwise. When we act ceremonially in, ch in a church, we signify who we are, who we believe God to be, and how we construe the relationship. Once again, I'd like to quote a first-person testimonial, this time from an old college friend of mine who, like me, spent many years in the so-called reform of the reform camp, and who, like me, has crossed over to the beauty and orthodoxy of the church's traditional rites. A former teacher of ours had complained about a Latin mass he'd attended. My friend wrote in reply, I'm sorry to hear that you felt bewildered at the old mass. I felt that way when I first started going as well. Many things were foreign, but I decided to let the rite just be itself. After all, it developed naturally over the course of centuries, so it must have something going for it. I have to admit, it took some adjustment. It's really a different way of going to Mass, from an almost exclusively linear, literal, left-brain exercise to where I could let other faculties kick in. If you go to the old Mass expecting the same experience as the new, you'll be bewildered just like I was at first. The use of Latin was actually a relief to me. No need to have to take in every word for an hour. That's what you have to do. <laughs> Uh, letting the ritual actions and symbolism, almost an afterthought in the new rite, come into greater relief. The Mass revealed itself to me first and foremost as an action of Christ, more than as a service or something we did. Words fall short and often get in the way, and by this standard, the almost non-stop verbal expression in the new rite compares poorly with the multi-layered symbolism and iconic ritualism of the old. When I stopped trying to make the old rite conform to my way of thinking as a modern and trusted it to form me according to its own spirit, my bewilderment turned to peace and gratitude. One of the most striking aspects of the old mass is the immense power of its wordless symbols. These take many forms, bodily motions and gestures, a greater number of liturgical ministers with more diversified roles, the greater number and variety of vestments. Ironically, in light of its reputation as the special preserve of Latin literate intellectuals, the traditional Latin mass is in fact a much more physical and sensuous liturgy than the Novus Ordo. That explains why the old rite can so easily convey to the faithful a sense of the prayer of the church, even when they're not following word for word what is being said. In contrast, a liturgy that is predominantly verbal and ceremonially simple is much easier to zone out of since the vernacular drone rarely stops and there is little else to catch the mind's attention. It's like being in a cafe or a restaurant even, where one grows accustomed to not paying attention to what people are saying at the next table over because you're hearing it all the time. Many commentators in recent decades have noted that modern Western culture, and for that matter, the rest of the world influenced by the West, is shifting from the textuality of the Gutenberg age to a preference for moving sights and sounds, that is, audiovisual interaction, looking, watching, listening. Therefore, it will be of capital importance that the liturgy appeals to all the senses, especially sight and hearing, but in ways that are not bookish or cerebral. The traditional liturgy admirably suits this need, which is both pre-modern and post-modern, because frankly, it is human.
It manages to convey much meaning without the use of many words through pregnant gestures. The offertory and the canon offer notable ex uh, examples. The priest lifts up the paten towards the crucifix. He lifts up the chalice. He bows low before the offerings. He washes his hands. He bows again for the sushipe. And all of this is done in a soft voice the congregation cannot hear. There is something so eloquent about the gestures themselves that one can easily be absorbed by them without the need for any book or prayer or explanation. It is like a mother's calming touch on a crying child, or a lover's caress of the beloved's face, or a policeman's upraised arm stopping traffic. Wordless but effective. Indeed, all the more effective for being wordless. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, we exhibit signs of humility in our bodies in order to incite our affections to submit to God. Thus, when we genuflect, we signify our weakness in comparison with God. And when we prostrate ourselves, we profess that we are nothing of ourselves. So those, those meanings are somehow implied in those very actions. Yet there is something more. The silent but definite gesture, such as these, these from the offertory and the canon, is open-ended in its intelligibility. It has not yet been pinned down by accompanying audible words so that it must mean only this and not that. Thus, while the offering up of bread and wine is not susceptible to an infinite variety of interpretations, neither is it prematurely and preemptively closed off by a script. Watching it, the faithful can fill it to some extent with their own meaning, prayers, or aspirations. There is room for a healthy subjectivity. It is a kind of controlled environment for the free flight of religious imagination and feeling. Let me try to explain what I mean by that. As I watch the priest lifting the paten with the host silently, or lifting the chalice with the wine and a drop of water, I could think of the bread and wine being offered up to God as my own life and labor and suffering, which I give to him to be transformed. I could place on the paten with the host a suffering acquaintance, a deceased friend, an estranged relative, a child or a grandchild who needs my prayers. I could marvel at how special the priesthood is to be able to offer gifts and sacrifices in atonement for sins. The thought might occur to me that the angels wish they could make an offering like this. Perhaps they have a holy envy at what a man gets to do, which they, being bodiless, will never be able to do. I could think about the way Christ Jesus, summing up the whole universe in his person, is offering to God the whole of creation. Basically, anything to do with offering, sacrifice, gift, dedication, mediation, it's all compressed into these wordless rituals, which thereby acquire a kind of weightiness that carries me along with the motions, even if I have no words or ideas in my head at all. On some days, I am awake, alert, and full of thoughts. On other days, I am tired, distracted, not feeling well, or reeling under the blow of some bad news. And on those occasions, I can just sit quietly and watch and let the orderly gestures calm me and reassure me that the Lord is greater than my problems. He abides always the same. In my own experience, I have made all sorts of uses of the silent times at Mass and the gestures I'm watching so that the Mass has felt increasingly mine in the sense of being something I have invested myself in, while at the same time remaining utterly objective, unchanging, the same whether I am present or not. It is vastly greater than me, so much so that it, it can become mine and yours and everyone else's without diminishment or distortion. In this regard, it is like any great work of art. In point of fact, the traditional mass is the greatest work of art in Western civilization. The possibilities of subjective engagement with a great work of art are nearly endless. But the work of art remains exactly what it is, pre-existing us and surviving long after we are gone. Pondering all this has helped me to understand why I always feel such a sense of spacious freedom at the traditional Latin Mass, and why in the years of my life when I was still attending the Novus Ordo, I came to feel at times imposed upon and pushed around by it, like a refractory child in the hands of an imposing school teacher. The classical Roman rite is so dense with layers of fixed prayers and regimented actions that it has a kind of inevitability about it, like a natural process. It moves along like a purling river or a soaring bird. 
watching the priest go through the offertory or the canon or watching the servers pass by, weave around, genuflect and bow is almost the same psychological experience of meditative peace as watching the river ripple past or the bird float in the blue vault of heaven. Today's fashionable lingo might apply the word Zen to my description, and yet the Mass has nothing to do with canceling oneself out into a cosmic oneness or nothingness. We are still bound to a particular apostolic rite, suffused with Christian meaning, so our meditation, whatever it is, invariably circles around and leads us back into the mystery of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and the glorification of the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will see the same thing if we look at the hundreds of symbolic actions and items used in the traditional liturgies of the church. During the Latin Mass, the priest makes many bows, genuflections, kisses of the altar, and motions with his hands. He frequently makes the sign of the cross upon himself and upon other objects on or around the altar. He moves from place to place with a studied step and a definite destination. All of these things are done for a reason. We can trace their historical origins and subsequent developments. We can identify their practical purpose or spiritual significance. But these symbols are open-ended. They not only allow for, they positively encourage the faithful to see meaning in them, even to invest them with meaning, as occurred in the flourishing of allegorical explanations of the Mass, which flourished in the Middle Ages and were bitterly deplored by later liturgists. What I mean by the allegorical explanation is when when, a, when an author says, you know, the, the, the sequence of events in the Mass is like the sequence of the events in the Passion of Christ, and then they associate this thing with the stripping of Christ, and this thing with the scourging of Christ, and so forth. That's what I mean by an allegorical explanation. It's something basically superimposed on the Mass, and yet it's not random. It's actually based on what's in the Mass. Yet even subjective or arbitrary interpretations can essentially be in harmony with the objective referent, as meditating on the mysteries of the Rosary is essentially in harmony with the representation of the same mysteries in the Mass. That's why if you pray the Rosary at the Mass, it's not some kind of horrible crime. No, I mean, the, the mysteries of the Rosary fit in with the mysteries of the Mass. The ancient medieval exegetical freedom exercised on the traditional rites given to us by the same ancient and medieval church has often led me and others to notable breakthroughs in our understanding of the faith and how to live our life. The old liturgy has accumulated so many features over the centuries that, like a vast rambling mansion that never seems to run out of rooms, closets, attics, passageways, gardens, fields, or forests to explore, one really never sees it all or gets to the bottom of it. The old liturgy has a quasi-infinite number of hooks on which we can hang our thoughts and feelings. What's the upshot? I guess I would say, do not be afraid to attach personal meanings to ministers, objects, or actions, or to adopt the allegorical meanings given in devotional literature and so-called methods of hearing the Mass, if they help you to pray. One sign of a great work of art, I touched on this a moment ago, is that it makes room for and has the wherewithal to provoke many responses, all tied more or less closely to its own ingredients and drawn back into them. The Mass is the greatest work of art the West has ever known, exceeding all others in its density and its fertility of cultural power. Reading off spiritual senses from the literal sense of the Mass is no less natural and fitting than doing the same with the narrative of Israel in the Old Testament. Let me offer you, offer you a wonderful and beloved example. At the elevation of the host and chalice, according to the instructions of the rubrics, the servers are to lift the priest's chasuble, which was necessary originally because of the design of the medieval chasuble and its heavy, richly ornamented fabric. Today, this custom is maintained or retained despite modified forms of vestments, not least of all because of its beautiful and symbolic meaning when one recalls the woman with an issue of blood who was healed by touching the hem of Christ's garment and then sees in this gesture a symbol of the sanctifying power that emanates from the sacrament of the altar. Lest you might think I am saying that the traditional mass is a sort of playground for the daydreaming imagination, I hasten to point out a fundamental truth. The mass as it developed over the centuries always moved in the direction of ever greater coherence between form and content. That is the ever more perfect expression of what we believe in how we pray. 
In other words, the Tridentine Rite is a fully articulated confession of the Catholic faith in all that it says and all that it does, what it contains and how it is performed, and just as importantly, what it prevents and excludes. In this way, the traditional liturgy is the most grandiose demonstration known to man of the familiar axiom, actions speak louder than words. It doesn't matter if all priests and bishops started preaching the real presence from now until the end of time in every homily at the Novus Ordo. It will never make a difference because the liturgical rite itself does not proclaim, now in hushed whispers, now in resounding cries, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, is present here in our midst. Fall down and worship him. It is not poor catechesis that explains the Pew Research Center, Center's discovery that two-thirds of mass-going Catholics do not believe in transubstantiation. Rather, the form of the modern liturgy is inadequate to the mystery of the real presence. Father Robert Spataro makes just this point. He says, Objectively speaking, the old rite of mass expresses faith in the real presence with greater devotion and, I would dare to say, greater conviction than the Novus Ordo. We all know well enough the ritual gestures of prostration before the Eucharist, as the law of belief becomes the law of prayer. Every time the hands of the priests must enter into contact with the consecrated species, he genuflects much more frequently in the Vetus Ordo than, than, the, than in the Novus Ordo. Vigilant and diligent care is taken so that not even a fragment of the consecrated host may be lost. Think of the joining of the thumb and index finger by the priest from the moment of the consecration until the final ablutions, or of the use of the corporal and the other sacred linens. At the moment of the consecration, all the gazes of the faithful are joined as rivers into an ocean of love in adoration of the consecrated species. It is moving and edifying to see the faithful of every age and condition kneel down devotedly at the altar rail to receive the body of the Lord on the tongue, as with paten in hand, the gaze of the minister or acolyte accompanies the motions of the priest, anxious that every fragment be collected and consumed. The whole Vetus Ordo, the Old Mass, is a splendid profession of faith in the mystery of transubstantiation. Unquote. That's Father Roberto Spataro. The wealth of symbolism in the old rite is not, after all, so difficult to grasp, even if it remains always beyond our complete grasp, which is good, not only for our humility, but even more for our piety, since we will never feel that we are masters when we are only ever disciples. There is always something to catch hold of, or more likely, something that catches hold of us. Think of how complex the asperges rite is. I'll just give you this example. You have the intonation of a verse from the great penitential Psalm 50, taken up by the choir in the congregation, the priest walking up and down the church wearing a processional cope and sprinkling the faithful with holy water to purge their venial sins and call to mind their baptismal dignity, the bowing of one and all towards the sanctuary during the chanting of the Gloria Patri. This is Sunday worship. And Mass, properly speaking, hasn't even started yet, right? This is before the Mass. The Catholic faith must be in our bones, in our muscles, in our knees, in our hands, in our ears and eyes, before it will ever permanently lodge itself in our minds and become the dominant force in our souls. There's a famous popular psychology book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts. It's a very popular book, as you might imagine. His basic thesis is that there is not just one way to say, I love you, but five distinct ways, and each person gravitates towards one of these love languages. They are, number one, words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, physical touch. So if spouses desire the best relationship with one another, they have to find out each other's love language and make a point of trying to speak it. That's Chapman's thesis. Mutatis mutandis, the theory can also be applied to the activity of liturgical worship. The, uh, the, the, the faithful have different worship languages, you might say. Some of the faithful lean heavily on the words of the liturgy. These are the sort whose missiles are carefully beribboned, tabbed, and holy carded, and who are quickly frustrated if they can't follow along in their missiles because they don't know which votive mass the priest is using. Others in the church just want to spend quiet time with the Lord. 
they tend to be drawn towards the, lo the low mass and holy hours. Still others are looking for ways they can interact with their minds and bodies, not necessarily based on the words, but based on an economy of giving and receiving, of doing rather than listening or talking. These people imitate many of the gestures of the celebrant. They are drawn to pray at the side altars, lighting candles at the shrines. The Latin mass and the environment it creates afford a broad scope of engagement for all types of love languages. It has the words for those who rely on words. It has the silence for those who rely on silence. It has music and pageantry for those who lean on their senses. It has the physical engagement of making signs of the cross, beating the breast, bowing the head, genuflecting, and lots of kneeling. In other words, it speaks all the languages of man, going well beyond simple communication or the exchange of ideas to the reality of communion. That is union with the divine present in our midst, but beyond us altogether. The end of worship, finally, is not to understand ideas, but to be one with God. This is the crucial point. Jesus too speaks all the love languages, which is why he gave us our great liturgy in the first place, why he has preserved it for us against the sins of his representatives, and why he continues to give himself to us in the flesh, not only in the spirit. I have argued that the old Latin mass communicates the ineffable, meaning the things of God and God himself through a powerful nonverbal language or even array of languages. In conclusion, allow me to draw three consequences from this truth. First, if I am right to say that the Old Mass speaks a rich language of symbols and that these symbols are there for a reason, we should try to improve our understanding of this language. Although some of it is evident enough, as I hope I've shown, it does contain a lot of subtleties. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, the more we know something, the more we are able to love it, and the more we will love it. The more we know about what goes on in the Mass and the rich prayers that are used and the gestures, the more fruit we can derive from it. And from there, we can move on to the divine office. If you, if you, if you finish the Mass, which you'll never do, you can always move on to something else, also part of our liturgy. It pleases me to be able to say that there are more and better resources now available on the traditional Latin sacramental rites and the divine office than ever before at every level or type of readership for priests and religious, for parents, for children of all ages, for young adults. A heritage does not automatically defend itself or explain itself. It needs to be received, taken up, appreciated, fought for, and passed on. <coughs> Second, and in close connection with the last point, the Mass is all-sufficient as the prayer of the Church and the offering of Christ's sacrifice, but it is not all-sufficient for doing the work that each individual baptized Christian must do for himself, and that only he can do namely to come to Mass with the right spirit or disposition. Although God can and does perform miracles of conversion, in the normal course he expects adults to cultivate this spirit in themselves and parents to develop it in their children through daily prayer, Catholic family customs, good catechesis, and far more importantly than most people realize, the nourishing of the imagination with good art, good music, good stories, and poetry. As one who largely agrees with the philosophy of John Sr., and if you haven't heard of him, you can ask me about him afterwards, I can't emphasize enough that at least half of the battle for the souls of children is a battle for their senses, imaginations, and memories. This comes before and always accompanies the battle for intellects and wills. Finally, if someone were to ask, what is the single most important thing we can be doing as Catholics right now to respond to the crisis in the church and to contribute to its healing? I would say without hesitation in the words, again, of Father Roberto Spataro, let us take care that celebrations of the Vetus Ordo are regular and dignified. They speak for themselves. They strike and attract those whom we invite to it. Not everyone instantly falls in love with the old mass and some may walk away in disgust but many do fall in love sooner or later. And this is often the beginning of a major turning point in their lives as Catholics, in their quest for holiness and in their ability to become part of the solution rather than floating along with the status quo. If church history gives us any guidance, the long hard campaign of restoring tradition will not happen by a sudden divine intervention as much as we might wish, but by the diligent, faithful, dogged, and generally unnoticed efforts of Catholics like you and me.
Thanks be to God that he uses even weak instruments to prepare and execute his victory. Thank you for your kind attention. So is, is, the, is the challenge you're asking about how to form and keep going a Gregorian Scola? Um, I mean, you know, in the, there, is, there, is one, there is one hard reality, and that is there has to be at least one person who can chant very well. That's, that's the hard reality. Um, if you don't have that, if you have a group of people who are all good-willed, but they, can, can't, they, they can't really confidently um, do the chant, um, then it's a little bit like throwing people into the water who don't know how to swim, you know. But if you have a confident leader, then other people can learn and lean on that leader and, and sort of join arms with the leader, and then they can actually make music together. Um, so, you know, it, it is, I mean, I just, I would just say there are situations uh, that I've encountered where a particular community just doesn't have that capacity. Um, and you know, then then it's almost like praying for vocations, right? It's like we need somebody who can do this. You know, Lord said this, somebody who could do this, or find the person who can do it. Sometimes there are people who are musical, but you don't know it initially, or, or there there. Are, this is a big problem. I mean, it's it's a problem. It's it's both. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful problem. But often you find that somebody who's a talented singer, um, you know, is very busy with a large family. And you know the husband or wife doesn't want to, to let the other one go, and I understand that. I completely understand that. Um, but it's it's really important to try to to, to find that talent, and then uh, and then use that as the kernel around which the scola can form. You know, um, I will say that uh, there there are the. I mean, it, it it takes a lot to get to a fully sung, a fully chanted high mass with the full propers, the full ordinary. That's that's a, a pretty tall order. For a, a new choir, um, but you know it's possible to sing even at a low mass to sing some of the simpler chants like Ave Verum Corpus or Adorate Devote or Ave Maria um, or you know uh, uh, Salve Mater. I mean, there's a whole host of chants that are much much easier than the mass chants, and those can be sung as devotional songs, basically hymns at a low mass. Um, at a high mass, you know, the choir can work to sing the introit, but do the other ones in psalm tone, you know, in a, simp in a much simpler way. So there's, there are definitely incremental steps that can be taken as well. And then the only other thing I'll mention is, um, although it's, I think it's best when chant is sung without organ accompaniment, um, if you, sometimes it's, it's, it's necessary to have the organ accompaniment to keep it going and to hold up the pitch and to give people more confidence. Uh, and so nobody should feel ashamed about bringing the organ into it as well. Except during Lent, of course, <laughs> Lent and Advent. Yeah. Okay, so they're kind of related questions, actually, because um, when you when you when you delve deeply into the history of the Eastern and Western rites, Christian rites you discover a lot of really wonderful parallels with Jewish temple worship, temple and synagogue worship. Um, you know, for example, if you read in the Old Testament in, say, the Book of Chronicles about the organization of the priests and Levites, uh, there, there's very much, there's a high priest, and then there are assistant priests, and then there are Levites. It's like priests, deacons, and subdeacons, so this kind of hierarchical picture that you get. There are also dedicated singers. It talks about that, which would be like the scola, you know. Um, you know, you have incense, you have... Uh, Obviously, by the time you get to the book of Revelation, which is in the New Testament, but is also based on Jewish precedents, you have candlesticks, um, you know, uh, although that's also in the Old Testament. Uh, and so there are many, the, and, and of course, it's the whole Old Testament religion is sacrificial, it's ordered to sacrifice. And the sacrifices, some of them are holocausts that are completely burnt up, but others are offered to God and then the people partake of the sacrifice. And so that's also what we have. The Christian liturgy is fundamentally a sacrifice, not a meal. It's a sacrificial meal, but it's, it's not just a meal, right? And one of the biggest deviations that occurred during and after Vatican II, mainly, well, before, during, and after, um, if you look at the particular individuals who were influential, is that they really wanted to uh, recast the Mass as a kind of reenactment of the Last Supper. And that's false. That's not what the Church teaches. The Church teaches that the Last Supper itself is when Christ instituted the Mass and the Eucharist, but in anticipation of his sacrifice on the cross the following day, 
And the mass represents that sacrifice. It's not a reenactment of a meal, right? And this is such a, but the, the idea of the mass as a meal is a Protestant notion. Luther is the one who first articulated that. Um, and when you get to somebody like Calvin, Calvin says, because it's a meal, therefore people should take the food in their hands and feed themselves the way they do at a meal. And so Calvin abolished all kinds of, of symbols of the real presence because he said, this is not, he did, you know, there isn't, there isn't the real presence. It's just a, a symbolic meal, right? A sort of brotherhood meal. Um, so there's a lot of problems that start when you, when you move away from the Old Testament roots, which were the origins of the Eucharist. And, and that's, there's a lot of great stuff written about, like Brant Petrie and others have talked about the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. Um, what, what they don't realize, th that whole kind of Augustine Institute, Bible-based approach to Catholicism, which is really has a lot of excellent, beautiful insights, the, the authors writing those things, with the exception of Scott Hahn, are totally unaware of the traditional Latin liturgy. So they don't know how much of what they're talking about is actually in the Latin liturgy and how much of it was removed from the Novus Ordo. And so they get really excited about the kind of crumbs that they find, but, they, but they're kind of missing like the boat. You know? <laughs> so I, I still hope that someday you know, they, they will all come around to seeing what Scott Hahn has seen, which is that um, the traditional Latin mass is in fact the um, kind of the extravagant fulfillment of all of the Old Testament types. Um, but then your other question had to do with pontifical mass. And it's actually really easy to, to conceptualize this. In the early church, um, what you had were, well, the, so the, the earliest church, that is the apostles after the resurrection of Christ, the kernel, the core of the church, um, was made up of the bishops. There were not priests yet. There were not presbyters. There were just bishops. Um, but as the church expanded, and, and so actually, if you, if you look at the earliest documents about the liturgy, it's pretty much the bishop celebrating the Eucharist with everybody around him. But you're going to pretty quickly outgrow that model where you have so many Christians that the bishop can't be everywhere. He can't say mass for everyone. And so it seems like historically the presbyterate is a kind of extension of the bishop. So the priest represents the bishop in lots of places where the bishop himself can't go. Um, and the Byzantine rite has a really wonderful symbol of that, which we don't have in, in the West, in any of our Western rites. In the Byzantine liturgy, they have an empty chair to represent the bishop who is spiritually present wherever the Eucharist is being celebrated, right? So you see this chair, and it's like, oh, okay, that's the bishop's chair, right? Um, you see that in our cathedrals, but not, not in a typical parish church. Uh, so the original liturgy is technically a pontifical liturgy. It's the bishop's liturgy. And um, it wouldn't have been as fancy as a medieval pontifical liturgy. I mean, that did develop. The ritual, the ceremonial, all that stuff did develop. But still, the original Mass is the Bishop's Mass. The solemn high Mass is when you have a priest and, and two assistants um, as somewhere other than the cathedral where the bishop is. Uh, the high Mass is when you don't even have those ministers. You just have the priest. And, uh, and then finally, the low Mass. Um, in point of fact, I, I should have maybe even made this clearer, the, the real order historically is that you had the solemn mass and then the low mass was developed as a way for lots of priests, especially in monasteries, to celebrate a personal mass every day out of devotion. And then what we call the high mass or the missa cantata is a sung low mass, right? So this is something that a lot of people, it sort of uh, like initially fries the circuits when you hear it that way, but the, if you think about it, everything about the, the high mass or the missa cantata is simply the low mass, but with the priest singing things rather than saying them and with other people singing what he says. So it's, it's not um, a kind of shrunk down solemn mass. It's actually more of an elevated low mass is a way of thinking about it. The point there, maybe, maybe it's a point that's so obvious it doesn't need to be said, but, um, but I, I think what, what uh, Father Roberto Spataro is saying is that you know, the old mass speaks for itself, so the, the, the best way of um, contributing to the healing of the crisis in the church is to try to multiply celebrations of it. Now, of course, you know, Traditionus Custodes makes that difficult to do. Um, this, is, this is the burden that we're all working under right now. Um, but we have to keep thinking about the long term and not the short term. I mean, in the short term, people are taking hits here and there. Um, you know, Austin, Texas just lost one of their, their big masses at the cathedral. It's very, very, it's tragic. Um, but 
if we think in terms of the long run, there's more and more interest in the traditional rites of the church as time goes on. And, you know, as, as you yourself, you bear witness to this fact by being here. Um, you know, when I go to Latin mass parishes and I travel all over the country and the world, they're just so young, like the average age is really young. So that's where the energy is, that's where the youth is. And oftentimes when people go to a regular parish, it's like an ocean of gray heads. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm not trying to sound ageist or something, you know I mean? I love gray haired people, but it's just, it, you can see that there's a demographic shift that's really happening and is going to happen. Um, and I think that unfortunately, well, this, the, the reality is that the Pope and, the, and most of the bishops belong to that Vatican II generation where all of their hopes and dreams were bound up with the Vatican II and the Novus Ordo and everything, and they can't think outside that paradigm. They're really stuck there. Um, and so they haven't, we don't have leadership yet that has caught up with the reality on the ground, you know? Uh, I mean, it's like, there are so many funny memes about this, but you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a meme that shows like a bishop who's got like a baseball cap on backwards and he's holding a guitar and he's, or he, I think he might be holding a skateboard or something. And he's, he's talking to some young Catholics and saying, hey, you know, how y'all's doing? He's, try, he's trying to sound cool and he's completely failing, you know, and all of them are like, okay, see you later. We're going to the Latin mass, you know. So it's, it's so, it's kind of pathetic, you know, but when you see people of a certain generation trying to appeal to, to youth in all the wrong ways, you know. Um, they're, they're kind of appealing to their conception of the youth rather than the actual youth, you know. So, yeah, so this is just, this requires a lot of patience and, and um, but I think, I think, I do think we're going to get out of the, out of the woods um, sooner, sooner or later. Uh, I think that there's a fair, at this point, there's a fair amount of what I would describe as informal fraternal fellowship um, between the Ecclesia Dei groups, the SSPX, the diocesan priests, um, uh, you know, even sometimes non-TLM priests who are sympathetic, who are trad adjacent, as the saying goes. Um, but, uh, so I think there's, that's happening, but, but it's, it's not happening so well on a formal level yet. I think there's still a good bit of distrust on a formal level, not distrust, that's not the right word, but just sort of like, this is my territory, that's your territory, we have to kind of stick to our territories. Um, and I understand that for you know, the historical reasons behind that. Um, I know, f I mean, I'll just give you a concrete example. It's, it's not surprising that sometimes the, the traditionalist priests, and I'll just use that expression, the ones who've been trained and exclusively offer the, the Latin, the Roman rite, as, I, as, I, as it's truthfully, to be called, um, they're often very skeptical of having diocesan clergy come in and substitute because the diocesan clergy, for all of their good intentions, they often don't know it as well and they make a lot of mistakes and things. And so I, I think it's, it's just a matter of like, you have to have a lot of patience with each other and a lot of goodwill. I really strongly believe, I wrote an article a few years ago called the, the need for mutual humility and support between the FSSP and the SSPX. <laughs> I got a lot of reactions to that one, um, but surprisingly, a lot of positive reactions. You know, people saying, yeah, this is true. We all need to work together. Um, when, you know, when a ship is sinking is not the time to argue about, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? I mean, you have to like save lives and try to keep the, you know, the ship from sinking or something, you know. So when you're, when you're in a crisis, it's really important to make common cause as much as possible and not... Um, uh, maybe maybe Democrat or Republican is not such a good example. Maybe something like, are you you know a fan of this football team or that football team? You know something like that has to fall to the side. And I think uh, obviously the differences between the FSSP and the SSPX are you know are, are considerable ones, um, but they're still in the business of the salvation of souls. They're still in the business of rescuing and restoring tradition, and they have so much in common. Uh, so, but I think also let's make one last point. I think laity have a lot of freedom in this regard that the clergy don't have because the clergy are working within structures and they have to be faithful to their superiors and, and so forth. Whereas laity, we can, be, we can afford to be a more free-floating. It's not good to, free, to be so free-floating that you don't feel that you belong anywhere, but I think that um, we can be ambassadors of peace in that sense by becoming friends with lots of different traditional Catholics and, you know, and showing, showing that fellowship concretely. So that's my answer. Yes, so it, this is an interesting question because um, the answer you give 
has a lot to do with what kind of person is talking to you. You know, we all know that there are people who just don't read. They don't like to read anymore. It's kind of, to me, that's a tragedy. I mean, I can't imagine not reading. Like, reading is such a big part of my life. But, um, but I mean, there are people who definitely don't want to read very much. So for, for such people, um, you know, it's good to try to find a podcast or a lecture that they can listen to while they're commuting or whatever it might be or while they're doing dishes or something, because then it's much easier to, for them to absorb. The, and I'm not, this is why I have a YouTube channel. This is kind of, so I have, uh, on my YouTube channel, for example, I have a talk called Introduction to the, to the Latin Mass. And I tr just try to give the best introduction I can, you know, hitting on various points about this is why we do it this way, and this is why it looks this way, and whatever, um, you know. So I think that could be helpful for that kind of person. Somebody who, who doesn't mind reading, but uh, it, you don't want to necessarily give them like a 300 page book because that's going to be too much. But there's a little pamphlet by Joseph Shaw called Sacred and Great, which I highly recommend. It's a, it's a tiny pocket sized pamphlet. It's the kind of thing you see in a pamphlet rack at a church, you know, when they've got all these different pamphlets. Um, you can read it in one sitting very easily. Uh, and it's very um, clear and, and non polemical. It's just an explanation. It's the, similar to what I, how I describe my lecture. It's a, uh, a, a calm, and friendly explanation of the different aspects, the differentness of the Latin mass and why it is that way. Um, so that is really helpful. And I, I wish more people knew about it. I think, I think every traditional uh, chapel in the world should have lots of copies of this book, Sacred and Great, and just give it out like crazy to people. Um, the other thing too is if you're talking to somebody who has some experience or some, or some affection for a Eucharistic adoration, which certainly a lot of Catholics do, serious Catholics, then I think it's, it's helpful to say, think of, especially if they're going to a low mass, think of, your, think of the mass initially as a holy hour, right? You're going to be with our Lord and approach it that way, you know, the way you would a holy hour. Um, and then you can build as you go, as you experience it more, you can sort of fill in the gaps slowly, bit by bit, in what you don't, you know, in, in sort of coming to grips with, okay, now what's the priest doing? What's he saying? But that can all come in time. First, just think of it as, I'm here to adore the Lord. That's what I'm here for. Um, that, as I say, that works better for the low mass um, than for the high mass. Um, if you're talking to somebody who likes music and who likes things to be kind of, or you think would, I, I, there's a certain kind of person for whom the high mass is a much better entryway because the low mass is, it seems like practically nothing is happening for half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, and just like, what am I supposed to do with myself? But if there's music going on, there's incense, and there's just stuff going on, right? It's sort of like a sensory experience, as I was saying, and, and it, it touches all your senses. Um, I think that's, you know, something to recommend to certain people as the place to, to start. Last thing is, uh, and I'm sure you all know this already, but I think, I think it's crucial to in, when you invite somebody, if, if they're open to coming, ask them to go for a month. Ask them to go four times. Uh, because the first time, they're going to be bewildered. The second time, they're going to start cluing in. The third time, they'll begin to notice things that they didn't notice before. The fourth time, you know, they might actually begin to grasp some of the deeper aspects of it. And then when they leave and, and go somewhere else, they will notice the difference. The difference will be very strong to them and they'll have something to think about, right? I think once is definitely not enough for most people, right? So. Though, though I do know people who had like love at first sight experiences too. Like they went and was like, oh, this is what I was looking for. <laughs> but that's not perhaps uh, the, 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 the most typical reaction.